Hey, if you found your way here, it's because you're looking for some support with an unseen poetry piece of work. If you're from Blackburn Central High School, which is uh, where I teach, then you will have found this on Google Classrooms. If you have strayed in for just some home learning from an English teacher, then I have put a link in the description to this work pack, which is on my test um, shop, but it's entirely free to download. It's on my test shop. Um, I can't reproduce for... Um, people the poem but I can give you a link to the poem that we're looking at today and that's in the description as well okay let's crack on then um so when we're looking at unseen poetry obviously the word unseen brings with it a various degree of um fear and complexity so while I've spent the whole of my adult life deciphering poems and writing poems um, and therefore kind of very familiar with this, I know that when you're 14, 15, 16, um, it's not often the thing that teenagers um, choose to do with their time, to sit down with a poem and think, oh, just for the fun of it, I'm going to just have a little pick apart of this poem and see what it brings to me. I'm going to get under the skin of how the writer did it. So it does come with a certain level of fear and, you know, that's fine. What I'm here to do is to dispel that fear and say, look, there's some tried and tested methods that we can use to get under the skin of a poem. The first thing that your brain is after when it reads anything that is um, literature and kind of might have a little narrative, might have some characters, might have some ideas involved, is it really wants to know who's involved here what is happening and that's the first thing we read for that's the only thing really that our brains are capable of of absorbing on a first reading particularly in a in a, um, a high adrenaline high stress circumstance um in an exam so we don't worry we don't read the poem and think oh i can't do it i can't do any of it and then kind of collapse into a little pool of goo and spend our head uh, spend our time with our head on the desk after that okay so we're just going to take it really methodically. So as I said, the first thing we read for, who's involved, what's happening. So let's read the poem for those two things. Okay. So in Oak Terrace. So I like to say something about titles when I write about poems. Um, it's a little key to a poem, isn't it? The poet is either going to give you a key that names some of the things that's going to happen in the poem or they're going to send you in a different direction they're going to give you what's called a red herring now in this case in oak terrace suggests to us that we are going to be witnessing some of the things that happen in a house in oak terrace okay so terrace houses um Oh, lots and lots of houses next to each other okay um in many uh, situations they're kind of like your starter home almost they tend to be a little bit smaller a little bit more cottagey but you can get some massive terrace houses in um in some areas of the country um but here i think after we've read the poem we might start to think that this is quite a humble little little terrace is oak terrace I know lots and lots of students who've said uh, they've looked at the symbolism in the idea that this terrace is called Oak Terrace and we might do some of that later uh, so we might not have done with the title but it, in that first reading it gives us that little access to oh it's about what happens in a house so let's have a look what happens in this house let's find out who lives there old and alone fairly simple We've got um she sits at nights okay so we've got an old lady who lives here and uh, we're focusing on what she does at night old and alone she sits at night nodding before the television the house is quiet now she knits she rises to put the kettle on she watches a cowboy's killing reads the local births and deaths and falls asleep at growing stockpiles of warheads. Now notice how when I read this to myself, I don't stop at the end of the line. If I stop at the end of the line, I start to 
make the poem make a load of nonsense. Okay, I'll show you that in a second. So let's just have a look at those first stanzas. A woman, old woman, old, she lives alone. At night time, she puts herself in front of the television and she's nodding. She's either agreeing with what's happening on the television or she's nodding off. The house is quiet now. Okay, so quiet after a busy day or just quiet because family have left. I don't know. Uh, she's knitting. She rises up to put the kettle on and she watches a cowboy's killing. So that sounds to me like she's watching something on TV, maybe a cowboy film. And then she reads the local birth and death. So that will be in the newspaper. Who's been born, who the parents are, who's died recently. So she's keeping up with her local community, the birth and death there. She falls asleep at, and then we have in um, inverted commas, Growing Stop has a warhead. So it's made by the poet to sound like a headline, isn't it? Growing Stop has a warhead. Um, so she nods off. Um, a world that threatens worse ills fades. So as she falls asleep, the world, the physical world that she's surrounded by just disappears as it does from us when we go to sleep. And then she dreams. So at that halfway point, the second half of the poem is much more about um, what she dreams about. It doesn't end there, but this next section does. So she dreams of life spent in one house, suffers again poverty, sickness, abandonment, a child's death, a brother's brain melt into madness. So we get a little snapshot of not just this evening in her life, but this stretched out events in her wider life over a um, much wider time than one night. So those dreams of what happened to her come back to her. 70 years of common trouble. The kettle sings. Let's presume the kettle singing wakes her up so that she can head off to bed. At midnight, she says her silly prayers and takes her teeth out and collects her night things. And that's where it ends. Okay, so in its simplicity then, what am I walking away with? From If I stopped now, what has this poem brought to me? Well, it's brought to me a little snapshot of this woman's um, night. If you can hear screaming and shouting, my child is playing Terraria upstairs. I promise you no one is attacking him. Um, he's obviously got quite excited at one bit. Um, so I'm walking away with the, the idea that um, in this particular street, in this particular house, lives an old woman. 70 seemed pretty key by the end of the poem. She's old, she's alone. This is one simple evening, putting the kettle on, watching a bit of TV, reading the newspaper, nodding off in your chair, dreaming of other things that have happened back in time in your life, kettle singing, waking you up, and off she... Off she goes to bed. Okay, so that's what my brain took in on a first reading. Notice how I didn't get really involved in the language. Okay, now some of your brains might be able to do that first time round, but it doesn't matter if they do that first time or they don't. Okay, because you're not writing anything yet anyway. So if you're looking at task one in the pack, and don't forget the pack's available um, on my um, test shop but it is free to download uh, if you're home learning or you might have it on Google Classroom if um, you're a student who um, shares the same school as me. So task one just tells you to read the poem. Um, oh what I did say I'd do is um, I would show you what happens if you read as the line ends are sentence endings. So before we go into the task let's have a look at that and see how quickly the meaning disappears. Old and alone, she sits at nights, nodding before the television. The house is quiet now, she knits, rises to put the kettle on, watches a cowboy's killing reads, the local births and deaths and falls, asleep at growing stockpiles of warheads, a world that threatens worse ills, Fade she dreams of life spent. Can you hear? The meaning just goes. So 
my tip for you when you are reading any unseen poetry, particularly in the exam, remind yourself, I'm going to read until I hit a full stop, a question mark or an exclamation mark, because that way the sentences will make sense. So ignore those line endings for the moment, but we're going to get some marks out of those line endings later on. Okay, so we read it fluently, we just pick up who, what's happening. Then we're asked to make a list. Just list the things that the woman does, okay? Um, and if I was looking for a grade one, and if I was encouraging some of my students to get a grade one and helping them reach their target, then writing about just what happens to this old woman without much comment on it would get them there, okay? So we're starting at that, that level, but then we're going to look at how can I push that on for a higher grade because grade one students can push on really easily, okay? The reason being, we're all human. We all know things about people. We're good at reading people and we're good at understanding why people behave the way they do, okay? So there's always going to be higher grades available. So if I was filling in the table that you've got in front of you now, it starts on the left-hand column, what she does at night, what she watches television, and then I would just go back through the poem and I would maybe think, well, what other things does she do? Okay, so if we look, I'm going to try not to use the poet's words. I'm just going to list what she does. Watches television, she knits, she puts the kettle on. She's watching a cowboy film or a cowboy TV series. She reads the newspaper. She falls asleep. She dreams of life spent in one house. So she dreams of um, having lived in that house all, in her, all her life. Uh, and I might be interested in some of the things that she dreams about. Um, poverty, sickness, abandonment, child's death, brother's brain melted to madness. And already my brain is spinning off going, oh, that's sad. What a life, difficult to live with poverty, difficult to live with sickness, your own, or caring for those or others who you love who are sick, being abandoned. Oh my goodness, most of us have an, a, fear, a fear of abandonment by people we love. So already I'm starting to feel compassionate, empathetic. Her life is maybe not so different from the things that I've experienced. Um, a child's death, devastating, rare, but devastating for parents. So can you see that, <coughs> excuse me, even just by listing the things that she does, my brain won't limit itself to that. My brain just suddenly goes, oh, that's, I feel it. Oh gosh, that's sad, okay? And that is bringing our human and explaining how our human response operates. We're gonna get some lovely marks from the examiners, okay? Um, kettle weights are up, doesn't it? And at midnight, she says prayers. And the second time I read it, just to do this list, I then notice, ooh, the adjective silly prayers. Now that is interesting, an interesting choice from the poet there. He didn't have to put an adjective in at all, so why the adjective silly? So I'm just starting to notice what I might be able to talk about later on. Okay. Um, takes the teeth out, collects her night things, and off she goes to bed. Okay, so there's a nice little list of things she does. And as we've seen already, bra brains are racing ahead, kind of going, Whoa. Maybe I could make something of that. Okay, so you will see then in the right-hand column that you are asked for my ideas about why does she, why she does these things. So, <laughs> you know, most of us in a kind of a, a, a regular routine need to get ourselves to bed and we need to in some way entertain ourselves in an evening, don't we? We get bored. Human brains get bored if we're, we're just sitting doing absolutely nothing. So she's doing things that human beings do get yourself ready for bed entertain yourself a little bit in the evenings um so we're going to name those things now why would she do that 
okay so she watches television you'll see on the table that i've put she's lonely and she wants some company now you you might be able to say other things maybe she wants some chatter in the room maybe she wants to hear human voice uh, maybe there's a program on that she's interested in, that she's invested in. There's lots of different things you can say. Notice how I said maybe, 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 possibly, possibly, possibly. That's how we write about literature. Okay, we're going to do just a couple more of those together then. And then after that, I want you to bring your human, your experience of why would the poet draw that my attention to her doing that thing okay what feelings emotions or wisdoms arise within me when i hear that she, she's experiencing that okay because that is the stuff that's going to get you marks and i will let you into a little secret i am an examiner i don't examine on this paper but i examine on paper one and after a certain number of responses I can hear what the teacher taught these students and that gets lots and lots of credit but the thing that happens after a while is when I get a student who really responds from their own personal kind of viewpoint on the world that's way more interesting um, and the even bigger secret is that the unseen poetry usually for the examiners has the most interesting responses because your teachers didn't get in the way of who you are okay so we want to read we we might mark 350 papers we want to know 350 individual responses how did 350 individual humans respond to this poem because it's never ever the same and that is what makes literature great Okay, so I'm going to take you through a couple, but don't forget, if your brain is going, oh, well, you know, that makes me think of, go for it. Add it onto mine or go your own way with it. Okay, let's just do a couple more together. Then you've got some time to do some on your own and then you're done with task one. If you're spreading them out over the week, Monday's done, isn't it? So let's have a look. So the television one's been done. She knits. Okay, so lots and lots of people knit. It's something to occupy your hands, keep you busy. Um, it's entertaining. It's a nice little hobby. But also, if you think about knitting, um, I think the poet chose knitting because, yes, it is something that, that lots of older generations do. Um, although it's really cool now to knit. All the Hollywood stars are doing it. Um, it is something that older people do, and I've read that in responses a lot of times. But what a lot of students kind of didn't engage with is when you knit, you're, you tend to be making clothing, okay? This idea of knitting something warm to nurture and care for someone else or to nurture and care for yourself, to bring yourself warmth. Okay, so th that's what hit me about that. So those would go into my right hand column. So what does she do next? Rises to put the kettle on. Well, she does, but it's maybe for me something that's a little bit more difficult to start to make something meaningful from. Um, you know, we get thirsty. It's a basic human um, need, isn't it? <laughs> to to uh, keep yourself hydrated. Um, but the idea of, again, warmth, comfort, sustenance, to sustain yourself, to make yourself a nice drink, a nice warm, comforting drink. Is she missing human comfort, human warmth? Okay, it's like being hugged when you have a nice warm drink. So that's where I go next. Um... And I wrap it up in possibilities. Possibly she is missing. Maybe she misses caring for people, clothing babies, clothing her children, knitting for other people. Okay, so put it in maybes, make it reasonable, make it possible, and your examiner will absolutely be ticking across your page. Okay, once you've done that, there's only one more thing to do on your task one collection. And it's just a little summary. 
Now make three statements about what the poet suggests being old is like. So I look at my right hand column and actually I seem to have noticed that it comes with a certain amount of loneliness, a, a lack of human touch, a lack of human care, a lack of human nurturing, um, lonely, yearning for other people, reliving difficult times. Okay, so I've said loads there, but you know, tr practice summing up your own because it's the practice and the trust in the fact that you know enough about being human to go into any unseen poetry exam and go, do you know what? I'm human enough to smash this, yeah? Okay, so that's your task one done. So I'm gonna end this video here. I'll meet you for video two uh, and task, uh, the, the, the set of tasks for, um, for task two. So um, go and be bold and trust your inner wisdom.